Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies streamed to your PC, Mac, or TV instantly. Plus, get DVDs by mail in about a business day. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. And by Hover.com. Hover is domain name registration and management that's simple. For Hover's transfer concierge service, free for our audience, go to Hover.com slash frame. All right, this is a trailer a little bit longer than our usual opening video. It's so George worth it. Lucas, your movies have made millions of dollars. You are king of Hollywood. What I want to know is, what is next for George Lucas? I'm going to Disneyland. <laughs> and then I'm building a ride. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Marshmallow. What I really want to do is start making smaller, more personal films. Be careful, George. What? George, what's going on? Oh, my God. <laughs> what's going on? Where am I? Here. George Lucas's Star Wars prequels have received terrible reviews from the critics and sparked rage amongst the Star Wars fan base. That's not me. That's impossible. Hollywood insiders are questioning whether George Lucas has become totally lame. No! When I heard about midichlorians, only one thought kept me going. Find the man who made the prequels and destroy him. The game had changed in 20 years. I'm a businessman on my cell phone! Cell phone? So you're saying the guy shot the whole thing on green screen, John Williams? This was a systematic takedown. The corruption is deeper than anyone can imagine. I saw them do the same thing to Brett Favre. <sighs> Brett Favre? This is gonna require a team of old friends. Princess Leia. Short brown. Okie dokie, Mr. Lucas. And Chewie. Georgie boy has escaped. I suspect we might be able to do something about this. You still gonna have fun. They're gonna come at you from all angles, George. Spielberg, when they struck me down, I became more powerful than they could possibly imagine. Give me the answer, you bastard. How do you take down an empire like that? You shoot first. I like the new Indiana Jones movie. Welcome to the Temple of Doom! Damn! I can't get past the firewall! Oh no. Fear leads to anger. Shoot him. He's the imposter. Anger leads to hate. Jesus Christ, they're just movies! Hate leads to an ass kicking. I'm not afraid. You will be. Please, you got a wife and kids! Oh! Okay, George, even good directors make bombs once in a while. Visa? Her mind go boom. We are afraid of George Lucas. We're deathly afraid of George Lucas. Actually, I'm not. I think he's a great guy. Um, <laughs> Just because you went and saw movies with him, now you guys are BFFs, huh? No, you hang out I with your buddy. Bad word against the guy. He orders a good bag of popcorn. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> that was uh, that was George Lucas Strikes Back HD trailer uh, from Slick Gigolo on YouTube, and that was actually the second time I watched it. The first time I thought it was like, oh, that's 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 pretty funny, but like second time watching it through, it's like, okay, that's that's really genuinely funny. Well, they it's got obviously kind of made by people who love the franchise and know the history. Although it, they they do have a sense of goofiness too, because yeah, when they uh, said. When, the they, when, when he said, I'm going to assemble a team, Princess Leia, I thought I was expecting them to go from the slave Leia to a representation of the modern Carrie Fisher. But they just kept it in like, no, like Princess Leia is a real person. And he went and found her. <laughs> and, the, and the Chewbacca's just this crappy rubber mask. Yeah. Like, <laughs> but it hit all the beats. That's what I enjoyed about it, the whole heist film thing and the idea that, like, like I think there's some part of us who were disappointed by the prequels who really want to imagine that this is the real story of yes. what happened. This is the reason we were fed that. At any moment, that real George Lucas might come back with guns a-blazing. I'm I a like businessman on the cell phone! <laughs> yeah. Cell phone. Hmm. Brett Favre. Hey, man, how was your trip? Uh, it was great. I, uh, I got to hang out in, uh, back in my sister's farm, see my nephew graduate from uh, high school, and commence the rest of his life, hence the name Commencement. Oh, well, yeah. this little linguistic gem brought to you by Tom Merritt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm glad to be back uh, in the saddle on frame rate, man. Uh, I'm, I'm glad we didn't miss a beat, and I'm glad to have another big story. I mean, it's really the big story, not another big story. Because we have a segment called Another Big Story. This has been <laughs> the big story. I believe that the big story uh, should probably be about Netflix or Hulu every week. What do you think? I, you know what? It's not like we can vote and not make these the real story. It's not like, I mean, even if we voted, like, I vote that Netflix and Hulu stop doing anything fascinating that the whole industry starts talking about. They're going to do it, and it's going to keep on happening. Now, I'm with you. I privately am rooting for bigger stories, but this week, I mean, I think you're right. The biggest story is definitely the announcement of a, a possible partnership between Netflix Netflix and Facebook. What are the details on this? Yeah, so in a presentation at what, what they're calling the EG8 Tech Conference in France this week, it was uh, President Sarkozy's uh, attempt to get a lot of technology leaders together in France. Uh, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg gave a talk and mentioned Netflix uh, as one of the companies his team has held discussions with in an attempt to make music and television more a part of the social networking experience on Facebook. I like this because I, from a branding perspective, you like to have your brands stay specifically awesome at single jobs. When I think of Facebook, I think of the social aspect. And I understand that social is peripheral to movies and music and television shows and all those things. But why not go ahead and work out deals with all those con uh, uh, those content partners in order to put it in the Facebook environment. You know, it's it's that's the mistake a lot of these guys do is when they try to do everything, they end up having a mushy brand that doesn't mean anything to anyone anymore. Well, and there's so many social attempts uh, on Netflix, or I, I'm sorry, on TV and music right now. And I think it's smart to say, well, where are th where where is everybody watching? their stuff online. Let's uh, let's let's not worry about people watching television yet. Let's not try to horn in on Get Glue or any of those check-in services yet. Let's find a place where people are watching online video on Facebook and, and make a natural partnership out of that and say, uh, let's figure out how to take Facebook people and get them to watch more Netflix and how to take Netflix viewing and get it to get it to participate in uh, in sharing at least recommendations and picks and that sort of thing on Facebook. That, that makes a lot of sense to me. Well, and especially also if there's um, not that I would want to do this because my Netflix, I let the kids go crazy watching all the different movies. So as a result, I looked at my the things that it suggested for me on Netflix and I was just like, Netflix, you don't even know me anymore but i would love to if people wanted to share what movies they've been watching and what reviews they've given them how many stars that kind of thing that's a that's a perfect tie-in with facebook and it's something people are already doing over on netflix so it seems like it would be an easy integration to put it in what i'd like to see are novel new ways where like you and your friends uh let's say if they had access to the netflix recommendation engine and it was able to find not only based on what movies you like but also based on what movies your friends like to find the perfect movie that they think, hey, you guys both have individual movies that you like, different styles, different movies, but 
out, out of all the movies out there right now, we think that the two of you will give this a combined, you know, four and a half stars each. So you create a, maybe like appointment viewing. Like, hey, you're online, they're online. This movie, we think you're going to like to the tune of four and a half stars. Why don't you click play? You can have a party and you can talk, chat while you play. I think also they could probably address your issue of, hey, I've got one Netflix account, but my whole family watches it. Uh, by integrating with Facebook and allowing Facebook to say, you know, identify who watched this movie by Facebook uh, ID uh, and, and manage that a little more. Because Netflix has had the ability to divide your account up on the DVD rental side amongst right. different people, but they haven't had the ability to divide up the streaming yet. Uh, and, and Facebook would be a perfect partner for for putting some really cool tracking mechanisms in there for yourself to say like, oh yeah, that that was my daughter, that was Penelope, that was that was Bonnie, that was Brian. These are my family members. I you can name your own. Um, right. Oh wait, no, those are your family members. <laughs> yeah, I think you got confused there. I just got back from my cousin's graduation out in Illinois. Oh right, how was it? Went to, the, went to a farm. It was really a fantastic time. I watched racing with cars. Yeah. Um, yeah. Your life is so much like mine. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, so, I, yeah, do you have anything else before we move on? No, I, I just think, uh, now, the one hiccup about all this is, you know, everyone's so concerned about their privacy when it comes to Facebook, and unlike other Facebook, if you're talking about your geographical location, if you're talking about sensitive information, I, for some reason, what movies you like, to me, that doesn't, to me, that's a natural fit for Facebook. That's the kind of thing I want shared. And if someone's got a problem with the fact that I love the Big Lebowski to the tune of five stars, well, then Facebook's is the perfect platform for us to argue about it. Yeah, I, I think there are some people who are, who are going to want to have control over, you know, some things they watch on Netflix not being published to the rest of Facebook. Right. Because every once in a while, you know, you like a good romantic comedy, but you don't need to share that with the world. Shut up. Nuh uh. I, I like time traveling robot kung fu ninjas from the future. In love. What? what? In love. It, it, they're in love with kicking ass oh. and taking down the man. <laughs> From and the future. Sandra Bullock. Uh, Sandra Bullock is only the ringleader of the bad guys. That's why <laughs> I have to kill her with kisses. Is that what Miss Congeniality is about? Because I, I didn't know <laughs> yes. yeah. It is in this guy's brain. That's what's going on. <laughs> All right, let's move on to another big story. Officially, this one is another big story. Because it's the next one. Have we talked Stop about? everything. It's another big story. So Apple announced that next Monday at the Worldwide Developers Conference that they hold, they are going to announce iCloud. Uh, so, and everybody's talking about the fact that this is going to be a replacement for Mobile Me, and it's going to allow you to store your music in the cloud so you can get your music wherever you go. Greg Sandoval over at CNET says Apple's also trying to land deals so that you can put your movies and TV shows in the cloud as well. Uh, they certainly ought to get a jump on it. I mean, they have a tendency to wait till right when the clouds are about to burst and the thunderstorm's about to come down and come in and steal that lightning before anyone else has a chance to do it. And this could be another case of that. But I think, I, I guess this is something that happens more often than I would think. You know, I don't necessarily keep up with the pre-announcements. I just read the articles. But I guess they announced that they're going to announce. Is that what happened? Yeah, they, they never do that. They always announce that they're going to have a keynote, but they never talk about what they're going to talk about. For some reason this year, Apple decided to put out a press release ahead of time saying, we're going to talk about OS X Lion, we're going to talk about iOS 5 for the iPhone and iPad, and we're going to talk about a new service called iCloud. And they didn't give any other details about it. So I, is this a case where they want to set up expectations where it's like, no, you're not going to get another major hardware iPhone release story. That's not going to be your focus. We're going to tell this is the mystery that all of you should be. Like, is this a case where they're full on saying, by the way, uh, fanboys, commence the buzzing about this. Just make sure you're buzzing about yeah, the right thing. If you thing. don't mind, we'd prefer you speculate wildly about iCloud and not an iPhone because we don't have one. <laughs> It really is. It's weirdly these are like marching orders. I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist or anything, but I mean this is this is genius. It absolutely is. Um and but I think I think Apple could really sweep away a lot of the speculation about how it's all going to work in the cloud if they do this right. If yeah, they uh, have so the ability for you to put all of your iTunes media 
Everything is available in the cloud. To some extent, apps are already like that. If you have an iPhone or an iPad, uh, once you buy an app, you get access to it forever. You can Absolutely. reinstall it on any iPad or iPhone you own as long as it's authorized under your account. If they can mimic that model with music and movies and TV shows... Uh, and then say like, yeah, and, you know, you, we keep a copy of it for you if you ever need to re-download it. Then you don't need to have DRM, right? Right, because, correct. Which is the reason you're able to do it with the app stores. You've got DRM on the apps. But you can still offer that same ability. And and the, the objection, because apparently, according to Sandoval, uh, they've been negotiating with the studios on this for over a year. They've got a couple of the music studios on board, but the TV and, and, and mo movie studios are dragging their heels, is that well, they see this as competing with the windowing system that we've railed against for over a year now uh, right. on this show anyway. Uh, they can see it as competing because it's to them it seems like a streaming rental or a streaming of a of a movie. And Apple's trying to, I'm sure, in there trying to convince them, no, this is just a remote hard drive. But it's that whole conversation again, right? Well, and and if anyone's going to have the muscle to to make them see reason, hopefully it will be Apple. But there's a, a few things. Number one, I, I sincerely hope it becomes just like the way it is with apps because it's a nightmare. I wanted to watch I wanted to watch the Venture Brothers with my wife in the living room. I bought. The Venture Brothers on my iPad because I was out on the road. So I had the files. I paid for them. In order to watch it in the living room, I had to first synchronize my iPad to my desktop, which I hadn't done since literally since the day I bought it. I I never I activated my iPad to uh, over at the store. Had never synced. I had to set up all the sync. Had to transfer the purchase onto the desktop. Then had to go out to the Apple TV in the living room and then transfer it from the desktop over to the Apple TV, uh, or, I, or I get to set up the streaming over there, it was ridiculous and it was completely asinine and anything in away from that, anything that gets us to sensible, what Steam is to video games, this should be to all your media. Now, here's the other question I have is, how long ago did, did Apple start selling video game, or I'm sorry, uh, television and movies on iTunes? How, how many well, years ago? Well, they did this? TV shows a lot longer ago. I'd say TV shows came around 2006, 2007. We're Something looking like at four or five years, and I'm going to say that the landscape has changed pretty drastically from when those deals were first hammered out. There was, I'm sure there was a lot of fear about what it would mean, but uh, yeah, as far as having streaming on demand content or, uh, you know, of course, Netflix instant streaming was was barely a blip back then. If if it it must have been out by then, I think it was. But I'm going to say that hopefully, hopefully Apple was able to paint a picture that uh, that was able to make everyone see that they could make a hell of a lot more money if they jump on board with this and allow everybody to get their content how they want it when they want it, which is um, a little under reoccurring theme throughout frame rate. There's only one thing we ask, and that's to watch whatever we want, however we want. We want to pay you for it, too. Yes, exactly. Because the thing is, exactly. we know, Brian and I know, that right now, we can watch whatever we want, wherever we want, very Correct. easily. But we have to break the law to do it. And even above and beyond that, it's also kind of shady and difficult you make sure oh is, is this torrent infected you know i don't know we want the 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 easy non-controversial way to do it and Correct. as long as the, it's not outrageous as long as it's a low price like maybe free with ads or or very low subscription price like netflix then we're happy you will make I, a lot of money industry then you'll be happy and, and we'll be happy that you're happy making us happy plus uh, you'll have our money yeah. Everybody wins, especially you, because you have our money. And that's the way you want it. And, and now we... it's time for yet another big story. Because we have one more. And this is it. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. Do you tuck in your bootstraps? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, your bootstraps. I guess so. You don't want them dragging around on the yeah, floor. Yeah, just flailing yeah. all around. It's yeah. just like, you know, maybe if it's like a flood, like your toilet backs yeah. up. Uh -huh. Like, uh, tuck in your bootstraps. Here comes another big story. A flood of 3D. But this <laughs> time, actually, the New York Times reporting uh, that 3D boom may have already gone bust. Can you believe this? I uh, yes, I did read it, and I don't know exactly how to feel about it. I, it. On the one hand, I think we're seeing a sensible correction. I think the current application of 3D is insane, the way that they're just throwing it on everything. Did you I, see Pirates it, of the Caribbean in 3D? Oh, goodness, no. Do you Support think, do you think it was as a bad in the, in the movie as it was in the previews? 
Are you, are you looking over at Jason? Did he see it? No, he didn't. No, I didn't. Oh. I definitely didn't see it. But, but you, that's a movie you bought. You didn't even support your own flick. I don't know the last time I went to see a movie. Uh, uh, I'm, uh. I'm wondering when I'm going to come out the other end and, and going out to see a movie and getting a babysitter to do it will seem worth yeah. it. All right. Well, I, I didn't see it. <laughs> but, but here's the thing is there are movies for, for uh, that part of the experience, part of the very nature of the storytelling, it's, it's fundamental. And, and in those cases, 3D is phenomenal. I think Tron Legacy was a great example of it oh, in that the real-life scenes were all two-dimensional and you had this amazing transformation when everything snapped into 3D. I thought that was important as good. Uh, I thought that, um, of course, Avatar was, it was a, a grand-scale spectacle Tale where everything about it was calculated from beginning to end to be over the over the top, and I believe 3D was a very important part of telling that story. Uh, then you got a lot of movies where it's like on paper it sounds like 3D is going to make it amazing. You know, your Clash of the Titans or your um, uh, your Kung Fu Panda. You know, for the, but like for a comedy cartoon, I don't know. I mean, I did enjoy the 3D and How to Train Your Dragon, and I'm glad I paid for it there. But I can't think of too many other movies that I would insist on seeing in 3D, uh, except for, of course, you know, any sequel to Avatar is going to be important to me. And um, uh, I'm having a hard time thinking of what else is coming down the pipeline. Well, right the reason now. the reason I, I brought up Pirates of the Caribbean, I, 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 I'm guilty of burying the lead here, is the New York Times story is pointing out that on Stranger Tides, uh, which took $400 million to make, did poor 3D business in North America, uh, and Stranger Tides sold just 47% in 3D, while the norm has been about 60%. And Richard Greenfield, an analyst at the financial services company BT BTIG, thinks that American consumers are starting to reject 3D. Kung Fu Panda 2, Paramount Pictures' release of DreamWorks, sold 53.8 million in tickets from Thursday, 3D was 45% of the business again, a soft total and low 3D numbers. And so that, you know, analysts are starting to say consumers are turning against high 3D ticket prices and there you low go. 3D that was, that's quality. The difference. That's the difference. As you said, originally you said people are turning against 3D and I don't believe that's the case at all. I think what people are doing is they're turning against the high higher ticket prices for 3D. And w as long as the movie's available in both 2D and 3D, it's a second decision you have to make. You're like, okay, I'm going to see Thor. Do I want to pay $5 extra to see it in 3D? And for that one, I'd be like, no, I'd, I'd rather see it, you know, in 2D. Uh, but, you know, again, there's other movies. There's going to be your Avatar 2s and 3s that come out where it's like, of course, dude, it's five extra buck, and it's going to make it an amazing experience for you. Now, here's an interesting part of this story as well. Stranger Tides made $256 million on its first weekend abroad. Disney trumpeted that figure as the biggest international debut of all time. And the 3D French. made up 70% of those sales. Wow. And the Swiss. The Swiss and the French and the Norwegians and uh, the South Africans. So is it, is, it, is it our international audience is not yet weary of 3D as the, as the North American audience is? Uh, I think that's that's what they said here in this. They said it's it's still much more novel to the international audience. And of course, if you had given me enough time, I would have named all the countries in the world besides the United States for whom this is a, a more uh, a a more novel experience. Uh, and look, I'm going to say this is to be expected, and it's natural. And uh, as you as we have discussed here before, I'm a proponent of the proper use of 3D in in telling the type of story that doesn't quite work or you can't quite capture the vastness in a 2D environment on in a 3D inside the theaters. And of course, you know, I'm I'm down on 3D in the home at this point. But uh, what I'm what I think they're figuring out is that not every story gets better by adding 3D. And just, uh, just I would say the Pirates, Pirates of the Caribbean 3D just looked awful in the preview. And I guess if I'd never seen 3D before, I might be willing to give it a flyer. But I have. And I'm, I'm not paying 3D for that movie. It looked like cutout, cardboard cutout characters, like dancing in front of each other. It looked like a puppet show. It reminds me of the early days of colorization when they're like, we're going to take all the black and white movies, add color, but a big bang. It's like they're new movies. And then people realize like, wow, um... Uh, what was that? Uh, what, wow. What's the one that that the Christmas one with Clarence and the Wings? Oh, and it's a Wonderful Life. Yes, it's a Wonderful Life. Guess what? Not any better with color added to it than than in black and white. And so I think we're figuring that out with 3D. It's an important tool for certain types of stories, but as a panacea, just throw it on everything and it makes it better. People are figuring out that 3D is not going to cut it. Now, uh, you also uh, put in the lineup a uh, follow up 
on Roger Ebert's railing against dim projection for 3D movies. Yeah, I can't remember. Uh, you were there when we talked about that. That, was, that wasn't when it was just me and Sarah, right? Right. You were no, there no, I th well, either I was there or I listened to that episode and remember it as if I were there. But I know what oh, you're talking about. Well, either way, it works for me. But uh, And, of course, this is going to be kind of tooting my horn of uh, being right here in Austin, Texas, the, the home of the Alamo Draft House. Tim League wrote a very, very thoughtful rebuttal to the, to the dim projector problem, talking about what is and is not feasible and, uh, and in fact, uh, you know, I believe Roger Ebert just assumed that nobody was going to change their lenses. And he did a really good breakdown of why they went with the Sony equipment, the benefits to it, the, the superior quality. And uh, he mentioned in there, let me see if I can find the exact yeah, number. No, I was on this, that show because I remember I argued that some projectionists would actually be doing it because they love film and would make sure that the proper light, light right. bulbs and were Right, and I said most projectionists are making seven bucks an hour and, and you know, working after, after high school. But these guys are definitely the good guys. He says from January to April, we spent $23,000 on bulbs for the Lamar Theater alone, which is the theater I go to. It's like, a, it's like an eight, eight cinema theater. And, uh, man, do they take presentation quality seriously. And if you've ever seen a movie at the Draft House, I kid you not, they have a full one minute of nothing but music and giant white on black text that explains in detail what will happen if you talk during the movie. I've never been to a movie theater that respects presentation more than the Alamo Draft House. And reading this article, this blog post by Tim League really makes me proud that uh, that these guys are right here in my hometown. Dude, I was there when the Alamo Draft House opened, and it was a revelation because it yes. wasn't I had, I'd actually lived in Arlington Virginia where they had a similar concept of ordering food while you watch a movie but they were second run movies and the food wasn't nearly as good and the beer selection wasn't near I mean Alamo they knew what they were doing uh, well, and it's funny because it's like when you start to describe it, the most novel thing to say is like, oh, it's amazing. You get gourmet pizzas and beer during the movie. They're like, oh, we've got one of those. And you're like, no, no, you don't. Stop talking. Shut up. Shut your face. It's nothing like the Alamo, where it's like everything from the novelty of their promotions to the quality of the presentations to the food. Uh, it's it's so exceptional. There's a reason that your friend and mine, Mr. Brett Amtrek Rounceville, added to his list of 50 things he wanted to do when he quit his day job and toured around trekking around the universe for two years he put see a movie at the Alamo Draft House because it really is that spectacular. It's the only 3D porn movie I've ever seen was at the Alamo Draft House. They really did they? Yeah, in the early days, like the first year they were open. Wow, that is awesome. Because they used to do a bunch of classic, like classic, but like old movies at midnight. Yep, uh, and that was that was one of them they brought in. It was I just saw, silly. Uh, I saw a Shaft where your ticket price got you a free 40 of malt liquor. Yeah. See, uh, I saw Strange Brew with Bob and Doug, the D Bob and Doug McKenzie one. They you got a bottle of doing. Elsinore brand beer, yeah. which, of course, was a fictitious net name. That's awesome. All right, uh, let's take a break and thank our sponsor, Hover.com, because you probably, in the course of your life, are going to want to register a domain name. Maybe you have a great idea for a website. Maybe you just want to get one for your, your child. Uh, maybe you're, you're actually working at a company and, and it's your job to go out and grab that domain name for a new product. Hover is going to make your life so much easier when you do that by making it simple. They don't make you answer hundreds of questions or check off thousands of tick boxes. They focus on making it easy to register and manage domain names and email. That's it. Want a domain name? Yes. Do you want an email to go at that? Yes or no? Done. Uh, and if you're transferring a domain name to Hover because you like the way they manage things uh, and you're having a little a little issue. They have a no-hold policy for customer service calls because other registrars may have weird policies that you, you're trying to figure out. You call them up Friday, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern. You will not be put on hold. You will go right to a person who will help you. And because you're listening to Frame Rate on Twit, you get free transfer concierge service, which means you don't have to do any of the work. They'll See, do the I transfer for language. you. That is a service that you might have to pay for otherwise. Now, you still have to pay for the domain name registration. Uh, can, can, you, but, can you be like, can you pretend to be like really in a hurry? Like if you just want to feel like a CEO and boss somebody around, where it's just like, you know, hello, what's your name? Johnson. Listen, Johnson, I'm a busy man. I don't have time to transfer over my own domain. What yeah. can you do? Take care of that. Stat. I just Go. need your username and password, sir. And then they, right. they take it from there. Yeah, exactly. Put on a tie or not, and call Hover and feel important. Do it now. Hover.com slash twit uh, or, or go to hover.com slash frame and use the offer code frame if you want to show your support 
of frame rate when you take advantage of it. But either that's way. That's our show. Yeah. That's the show that we're on right now. That's, they should totally use that one. They should use frame. I'm just saying. Because I think it just is easier to type in. It, it, sure. Because you sure. know that word already. And the F and the R are really close to each other on the keyboard. They, you, you know what they are. You barely have to move your fingers. To do you can do it almost all left-handed. Just yeah. one little boop on Hover.com slash frame. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I barely move my wrist. All right. Uh, it's all in the wrist. Let's move on then to Film Found. Ah. Uh, I'm get, I'm I'm getting comfortable with that one. Yeah, I am. It's just the right length. Yeah, it's, yeah. It gets you in, and you, there's gunshots. Everything works out just fine. All right, we've got release dates and titles for the Hobbit movies. Uh, you're going to get Christmas presents in December in 2012 and 2013 on December 13th. December 13th, 2012, you will be able to see The Hobbit: An Unexpected Journey, and on December 13th, 2013, you get to watch The Hobbit there and back again. That's The Hobbit Part 2. Now, uh, this is interesting to me because it made sense when you're looking at the original Lord of the Rings trilogy. They're so epic and so sweeping. There's three whole books. But as I understood it, The Hobbit was meant to be kind of quaint as, uh, as, as an introductory novel to lead you into Lord of the Rings. Um, it, it doesn't seem like many quaint movies are split into two parts and, and are epic and good. I mean, are, are they overbuilding The Hobbit into something maybe it's not? That's, or is a, this that's a fair concern, right? I, my guess is, uh, because when you look at Lord of the Rings, that was broken into three novels by the publisher because they said this is too long to put out as one novel. Uh, and so J.R.R. Tolkien just kind of found some places where they naturally broke into three parts. And when they made the movies, they said, well, this is obviously too long to make as one movie. Even as three movies, you're talking about three or four hour movies, Still right? very dense, yeah. yes. So I think what they did with The Hobbit is said, well, look, we could put out a four hour movie, but it will be better as an experience and it will be better for the marketing uh, and the money if we put out two movies. So let's, let's break it into two parts so that we can actually tell the story the way we want to without compromise to the fact that, oh, you're sitting in your seat for four. Let's, let's do that. And, and the argument we can make to win the studio over is you get to sell tickets twice. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't remember offhand whether or not The Hobbit is as big as any of the individual books from the Lord of the Rings trilogy. No, it's, no. It, is, it is shorter, but it's still quite a long novel. And, and with novels, you're always having to cut things out. And I think Peter Jackson said, look, if I can get away with making two movies, I don't have to cut as many things out. I can really treat yeah, this that's well. fair enough. If it, if it really is a case where it's a love letter to the story and he doesn't want it, you know, if he could... You know, I'm sure if, if you ask Peter Jackson, if he could, he would have made two movies out of each of the books for the original Lord of the Rings series. We would have had six movies to go along with it. But there Absolutely. Comes point well, and that's why you have those extended cuts put out on DVD, because he's like, look, there was so much stuff I wanted to put in there that I couldn't. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. And, uh, you know, it depends. Uh, the, the question of whether or not they're doing it for the money, uh, I'm sure if you ask the artists, it'll be obvious that they have respect for the story. And even if the studio is doing it for the money, who cares, man? No, I, think, I, think, I think both are true. That's the thing. It's not a one or the other thing. I think they want to respect the story, and they also want to make a bunch of money. And, hey, here's a way where we can satisfy both sides of this equation. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, having said that, what uh, on a scale of, of one to brain explosion, how, how excited are you? Are you counting down the seconds to you it? Know, I'm probably uh, brain simmering on that scale. Yeah. yeah. I'm, not, I'm not brain exploding yet, but I probably will be close to it. See, I, 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 I liked the Lord of the Rings series a lot, but I only have watched the movies well, maybe twice each, and, and I haven't. It's been years since I've got maybe, oh, maybe see, six I, years. I pull them out pretty much every year during Christmas break and, and, and just put them on, either in the background while I'm, I'm vacuuming or this year. I was just tired. I just put them on and watched them all three. I, I really love those movies. And The Hobbit was actually the book that I grew up, and loved. I didn't read The Lord of the Rings till I was in college, I don't think. Well, and what's funny is I discovered it. Uh, I read the, the first book, The Hobbit, and loved it. Lo capital L-O-V-E-D it. But then uh, the first Lord of the Rings book, I got like halfway through. I got to all the singing and the songs and Tom Bombadil, and I sort of lost track. And then the movie came out, and the parts that I had read, the movie got right enough that I was thrilled to see how the movie ended, and I just trusted the movies from then on. So I finally got the full experience. So The Hobbit 2 part will be the first one that I've read the book, and I get to compare it when I see the movie. Yeah, yeah.
Uh, also, another one that I've read the book and can't wait to compare to the movie is Piranha 3 Double D. <laughs> you have not read Piranha 3 I have not, I have not read it. There is no book for Piranha 3. You're like, well, you're like, well, technically, I just found an old copy of Jugs, but I'm pretty sure but it's that's the same. pretty much the basis of this movie. Uh, if you know, you remember Piranha 3D from, from this past <laughs> summer. Uh, Piranha 3 Double D uh, has wrapped production, uh, or a wrapped shooting, I should say. Uh, uh, so it looks like um, they're, they're calling it so outlandish in places, I hope it works, because it really pushes all the boundaries slightly pushed in the first one. This is great because it's one of those things where I assume that they could, the, the you don't even have to hear a synopsis. You don't have to see a teaser trailer. You don't have to see nothing. The title itself tells you exactly the brand of humor that you can expect. It tells you exactly what type of movie this is going to be. And nobody buying a ticket to this is going to walk away feeling like, they, well, that wasn't the movie I expected. Unless they try to be highfalutin and smart. Well, you know, this is snakes on a plane with fish and boobs. Well fact, said. That was well original, summarized. That was, that was the original title that they wanted to do, yeah. but they're like, wait, why don't we communicate all that and just call it Piranha 3 Double D? Yeah, because the only thing that, if you really needed clarification on the title Piranha 3 Double D, snakes on a plane with fish and boobs. <laughs> <laughs> and and there you go. That is all you need to know to decide whether this is a movie you need to stay far away from or a movie that you must see over and over again. Which pretty much means, uh, hey, are you 17 or no? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have taste or no? Uh, all right, let's move on to a check-in on our summer blockbuster draft. Of course, frame rate in cooperation with NSFW show, participating in the summer blockbuster draft. And this is the week it gets real. Dude, it it is on, man. Stuff, I'll tell you, Sarah Lane came out swinging like a, with the vengeance. She walked up, she punched Justin Robert Young right between his legs. She walked over, she ripped the beard right off of your face. She spat in Jason Howell's eye, and she didn't even do me the courtesy of looking at me. I didn't even exist in her eyes. It's all over, if you ask me. She apparently forgot about Cargill, too. This thing. Uh, Brian is still in the lead. 343 million, but Sarah, based mostly on uh, the success of The Hangover Part 2, uh, is in a strong second place, 252 million. And Brian, you don't have any more movies. Sarah does. No, no, I do. I, I've got. Oh, you I've got, got one more. You're right. You have Zookeeper. I keep forgetting. I got two. I got yeah, two more. Captain I got America. Zookeeper, which I think has the potential to be a strong comedy contender. I think it'll be a lot like um, uh, that one where all the youngsters got together. Remember those comics from the '90s? That was the original title of it. Hey, remember these comics from the '90s? Yeah. They're older now, and on this movie, that one made a hundred million dollars last year. So Zookeeper could do this again. It's a Kevin James movie, and then also little thing. I don't know if you remember USA Fever. We caught. And killed Osama bin Laden, right? Captain America, all going to make a mint? Everyone's going to go see That's how we're celebrating? Sarah we're has Harry Potter. Sarah, Sarah has Harry Potter in the Deathly House. Mm. Never heard of it. Yeah. I understand that could be, that might be big for her. You never know. Now, but. here's the thing. You've got $343 million. Sarah's sitting at two hundred fifty two. Justin Robert Young at two thirty eight. Jason at one hundred sixty three. Cargill and I both nothing because we haven't had any movies play yet. This Let is the week my first movie comes out. X-Men First Class. Which I am really looking forward to that movie. As and I movie, believe we'll make $344 million. No, I don't. I, I think it'll make it the first weekend. It's going to shatter all expectations. <laughs> I think I'll be in first place at the end. No, I, I think it'll do well, though. I'm excited about it. And, and it's getting yeah. a lot of buzz. Uh, I paid 41 bucks for it, too. So I don't know if you I'm going to get my... big gamble, but I, I don't know if I'm going to get my dollars per earning. But I feel like this is the first really highly anticipated movie of the summer. It's it's the it's the official opening of summer movies. Memorial Which Day's one? over, graduates are out of school, and this is a movie that everybody's raving about. You you oh you're just you, you, the, the, the Hangover 2? You you're not saying that The Hangover 2 was the movie everyone was talking about in advance? Not not really, no. Okay. Okay. Ha hangover 2. What a Hangover 2. 135 million. It's not bad. It's not bad for one weekend? Yeah. Opening weekend? It's, you know, it's all right. That's a, that's a solid number. So what's the biggest comedy opening in, in in summer blockbuster history? Yeah, you know, it's pretty good. All right. <laughs> well, I'm with you. I hope, hope uh, X-Men is, if for no other reason, just to keep it interesting. Because 
to be, if you ask me, Sarah's got the top. Yeah. It's really a fight yeah. between you and me for number two. And and you know who's uh, who's had, had a, suffered a huge blow? We were talking about it earlier in that 3D conversation. Justin Robert Young with Kung Fu Panda, only $66 million. That's not bad, but Kung Fu Panda 2 was supposed to do a little better than that. Uh, yes, and in fact, I believe you and I made a side bet about which was going to do better, and I think I lost. I think I, if I remember correctly, I picked Kung Fu Panda, and you picked... Uh, that other one with Johnny Depp. Or, 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 or the hang, or, Hangover Part 2. Hangover, hangover sorry. Yeah. That's how little I remember 20 minutes ago. I thought both of them were going to do well because it's that kind of like, it's that kind of week where, you know, kids can go to the kids' movie and, yeah. Uh, yep. But you may be right. You may have thought Kung Fu Panda was going to beat the hangover. and I don't think I ever thought that. I'm not yeah, sure. I was counting on the kid factor because yeah. obviously it's so limiting to have a rated R movie. And especially, you never know if, if a sequel's, I mean, they're both sequels and they both had strong movies in the past. So I figure the kid factor would, would trump it, but uh, apparently not. It's because nobody's watching them 3D movies anymore. That's why I'm hosed. Now, usually when I fly out of town on a weekend, uh, you're, I'm good for talking about a movie that I watched on the plane, but I didn't watch any movies on the plane this time. I watched old episodes of Firefly. So what did you watch this weekend? Uh, you know what? I found myself, uh, some things popped up on Netflix Instant Streaming, and I ended up watching with my daughter. I had originally meant to start it for her and then walk uh, or walk away but like the first three minutes of the movie sucked me in it's it's so silly it's uh we watched it in french and uh with with u.s subtitles with the english subtitles which was kind of interesting because i didn't know if it would hold my daughter's attention because she's seven and reading is still kind of a chore for her but we both loved it instantly have you have you seen a town called panic no i haven't uh it's so silly and um the, the the plot makes no sense, but there's something so charming about the animation style and the simplicity of everything that uh, that I absolutely loved it. It gets it, it dips down like the first act, first third of it really sucked me in with like this is incredibly stupid and hilarious. But the middle middle third gets a little bit slow and then it wraps up nicely. I really dug it. And in the chat room, Uncle Big Bad says he hates that movie. Well, you sir. Uh, probably speak French and understood what they were actually saying. So it probably <laughs> disappointed you with the acting. I, I didn't know. I thought it was very funny. All right. Uh, let's move on then to Tube Tops. It's summer, which means we're only watching one show. What's funny is I look down and we're like, well, what are we going to talk about? I'm like, oh, there's only one item in all of Tube Tops that we're talking about. Well, like, we're, in that, we're in that, that Memorial Day break in the United States where all of the, the, fall, or the spring series have ended, uh, right. but the summer replacement shows haven't all started debuting. For instance, um, Rescue Me is about to start its final season. Uh, you've got a bunch of sci-fi shows coming along online end of June and early July. Uh, but right now... There's only one series that's bridging that gap uh, that was on this weekend. There's actually two. Doctor Who, for me, is on as well. But they didn't show one during the Memorial Day weekend because a lot of times the, uh, you know, people, people just don't around. watch TV, so they, they don't want to do that. Game of Thrones right. did not have that problem. They were on this Sunday. Do you know what? Considering that Doctor Who didn't have an episode over the three-day weekend, do you think that's part of the reason that they went ahead and released that episode seven a week yeah. early? Yeah. HBO Go customers, where they're like, hey, man, that's always a weekend that screws us over anyway. Why not give it out so if we get a dip, then we can blame HBO Go and credit that for the for the, for the the dip. Well, and, and frankly, HBO is not nearly as rating sensitive. What they want to do is keep people subscribed. And so if they're like, look, we're going to put Game of Thrones on because it fits our calendar, but we don't want people to get upset and miss it because it's Memorial Day. So we put it out on HBO Go, and that worked totally for me. I watched it on HBO Go, and I described my troubles last week but i had watched it so on sunday when i'm doing all the graduation partying and all that stuff i didn't feel stressed out like oh my gosh i have to go watch, make time to watch game of thrones i love this image that it's like it's your relative that graduates high school but it's you who's drunk talking about conquering the worlds at the party uh yeah it's we're also at a weird point now too because it's like we can't even start speculating about the fall season because everyone's made their announcements two weeks ago so there's there really was nothing new the only thing on my radar besides game of thrones is uh, breaking bad coming out in two more or no i'm sorry six more weeks july 17th is when breaking bad comes back so there's really a bunch of nothing but if you do have to fill the void you could not do better than game of thrones i am still so exquisitely happy with everything i enjoyed uh an episode i guess minor spoiler we're going to talk about what we saw not what we think is going to see let's yeah let's go yellow 
Yellow. Yep, I, I right. enjoyed seeing. I enjoyed seeing uh, Tywin Lannister for the first time, and to see the showdown that happened at the end of uh, episode seven. Now, are you like now? And again, this is speculative, and uh, you may want to fingers over ears. If you haven't read the book, we're not going to talk any specifics. But have you started to make a game as I have? Because you start to see their formula for what kind of big twists happen or surprises happen at the end of each episode. Have you made a game of trying to predict, like, okay, the end of next episode, this is going to happen. Next the episode yeah, after yeah, that. Yeah. This, I, I haven't even thought about it, though, but I am totally doing that. Where I'm like, oh, I bet they're gonna end right on the trial. That would make, oh, well, this the confrontation between Cersei and and Ned. That would make a good like a cliffhanger point. I, I wonder right. if they're gonna, yeah, yeah, totally. And, and I'm not and, always uh, right either. Uh, I actually thought that what happened at the beginning of episode seven, I thought would have happened at the end of episode seven. What what, what that happens to. Uh, uh, King Robert Baratheon. Ah, yeah, that would have been that would have been a really interesting, like you know, okay, he's gone. Right, and, that, you that know, just happened. Yeah, let's wait till next week to find out what happens. But you've got so many moments like that. I guess they they have a wealth of them to choose from, and that was what was so frustrating about watching on HBO Go and having it crap out three minutes from the end. I knew exactly what was going to happen to Ned. I knew yes. exactly yes. what was going to happen with the with the city guard. Yes, and I'm and I'm watching it with Eileen, who doesn't know this. And oh, she's looking at me wondering, like, why are you so hell-bent? I'm like, because you've got to see what's going to happen. to. She's like, yeah, but he's got the city guards. It's going to be a stalemate show. I'm like, no, it's not. Well, I can't. <laughs> but I couldn't say that, right? How much more fun is it to watch it with somebody who's not familiar with the books and to see them get sucked in? For me, that's all. I, every time there's an episode, uh, I call Justin Robert Young to ask because he has not read the books but is really digging the, the show as well. Yeah, it's it, you know, it does make me realize that I will say unreservedly, the show is best watched having read the book uh, because yes. you almost need a guide like The Wire is in some ways. You kind of need a guide to know, keep a track of all the things that are happening, but there's no book for you to rely on. Game of Thrones, there is. And you know so what? That, the first, that, that, that is, there's a nice guidebook for you there. There was somebody who uh, two or three episodes in asked me if he should read the book or just watch the show and read the book later. And I made the outrageous suggestion of try to try to stay ahead of the shows. Read the book and see if you can stay ahead of the shows. He later, everyone, a bunch of people thought I was idiotic to suggest that, that it's going to be confusing and you won't be able to keep up. The guy uh, wrote me thanking me, saying that he's now on to like book two and going on to book three. Yeah. So he got way ahead of the shows and he's and it's like he's enjoying it as a an interpretation of an experience that he's actually seen. All right, let's take another quick break uh, before we wrap up the show and thank our other sponsor for our frame rate, Netflix at Netflix.com slash twit. Uh, if you want to get online streaming videos that you can watch not only on your PC or Mac, but also on your television, and you're thinking, well, wait a minute, I'm going to hook up my laptop to my TV. That's one way you can do it, but you can also use your Xbox 360, your PS3, your Nintendo Wii. It could be a widget on your television. It could be on your Roku. There are millions of ways to get Netflix on your TV, and then you have access to a vast library of streaming television shows and movies that you can watch whenever you want. There's no late fees or anything like that. And you still get Netflix's DVDs by mail, which is, uh, you want to talk about a vast collection. There's oh my God. hardly a movie not available in their DVD collection. So if you subscribe and get the streaming and a DVD or two, uh, you're covered. You can pretty much almost watch anything you want. Uh, so try it out on us. If we, Brian, do you have a movie to recommend to get somebody who's like that? I just don't know if I want to try Netflix. What would, what would you say to them? All right, well, first of all, you realize 30 days, think of how many movies. You can watch two, three movies a day. You can consume vast series straight from, from the beginning. Uh, in fact, I'll tell you what I'm going to start doing. Uh, on the recommendation of my buddy CJ, I'm going to start watching Sons of Anarchy, which is on Netflix Instant Streaming. And, of course, whatever episodes aren't on Instant Streaming, you can get the discs for. And uh, and uh, check out A Town Called Panic. By the way, the guy who I said was complaining, uh, Uncle Big Bad, he later apologized. He's like, no, it's a great movie. It's just that my, my kid's seen it a hundred freaking times. And it's like, <laughs> I can't stand getting bored of it by then. Check out A Town Called Panic because it really is adorable. And you can find our offer 14 days or 30 days. 14. Screw that. 30. We're giving you 30. Right. Netflix.com. Right. You, now. You, get the, you get the Netflix. You I get just the decided. Quad that laser. Streaming video. Go to Netflix.com slash twit and get your 30-day trial right now. And we thank Netflix. Netflix.
for their support. Let's move on to Interfera. Now, first of all, before we get into your picks, Brian, uh, yes. there did you notice that Pop Tart Cat made an appearance on uh, the NewsHour <laughs> website? On the what? The NewsHour website. There was a PBS hack. A group oh, called uh, uh, Lulz Sec went after PBS because they didn't like a WikiLeaks documentary that they had run. And one of the things they did was they put the Pop Tart Cat up on NewsHour's website. That is awesome. Yes. And so uh, a friend of the show, Pop-Tart Cat. Glad to see they're making good. So uh, I didn't see any big web video stories that really got me amped up. So I, instead, however, I had so many amazing music videos people had sent over to me that uh, it was just, it, it was infectious and I wanted to share them. Um, uh, the, the first one I'm going to play, there we go. This is from a South Af African band called uh, Goldfish. And uh, I played it briefly on the video game brainstorm that we did on Friday, but you weren't there. You didn't see any of that, did no, you? No, I keep missing uh, the Friday, so I'm missing the video game brainstorm. I haven't seen this at all. Well, we'll take a look at the first minute or so of this. This is Goldfish. We come together, and it's great because it's all themed on 8-bit awesome things. See how many references you can pick up on. Pitfall Harry uh, yep. a bit there, which on the audio podcast you obviously don't see that. Uh, but also a uh, little Qbert, little nod to the Qbert. You don't see they, Qbert. They had, some, they had some Angry Birds in there. They had some. Uh, you saw the Qbert. Uh, what I like is little uh, the fighting style. You'll see. You'll, you'll be able to recognize. You're like, oh, that's so Street Fighter Two. That's that's what E Honda does here. And then you got references to everything from uh, Grand Theft Auto to uh, to Parappa the Rapper when they're in 3D two dimensions like that stuff. It's so dense that I also recommend that you check out the uh, the making of video where it's this is made by a handful of people distributed all over the world. And they kind of came together. They made this giant list of all the references they wanted to get in. And they sort of set up this, um, this backstory to the whole thing. Uh, and while you're at it, another thing I want you to check out is uh, if you just search for is tropical, the Greeks, and I don't is know tropical? Which is, is tropical, the Greeks. And uh, I actually don't know which, I think it's the, uh, let's He's see. tropical. I don't know which is the name of the band and which is the name of the song, to the be Greeks. honest. He's but tropical. you've got to, uh, but anyway, it's, uh, it's the visuals you're going to see. Well, I mean, they speak for himself, but he's basically watching kids playing with Nerf weapons. And it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's graphic, man. I mean, uh, it's it's all just kids playing with Nerf guns, but then they have added in the uh, the effects that put in all the explosions and the blood. They, well, you can tell, actually, if you watch the animation style, you can tell they're going for it. They're actually modeling it off after, after some of the effects that you see in Akira, uh, both of the, the explosion effects and then the, um, uh, and it's so funny because you're watching them play with Nerf guns and squirt guns. The C4 is obviously Play-Doh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
uh, the best part is about like two thirds of the way through the video, uh, everyone stops playing and there's just like 30 seconds of them eating eating dinner. And then they're just best friends. Right. Oh, well, because, you know, you got a break for dinner. Mom called you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, uh, in every way, this is what we all imagined we, we looked like when we were playing well, guns. That's exactly, <laughs> no, you nailed it. This is, this is the imagination of the kids being seen from from the outside because yes. a lot of people in the chat room are like wow that's just wrong because it's but it's really? you you know the, when you're a kid you imagine some really gory stuff going on yes exactly uh and so it reminds me a little bit of of in um a rushmore when they do the the play version of a, a serpico or i guess that was also a viral video that somebody had put together of, of kids doing all these adult situations and stuff uh and then uh i'm just gonna apologize right now because um this is going to stick in your brain, and I'm not going uh, to take it back. Uh, welcome to El Internet. <laughs> That's all it is, dude. It's almost it's become a genre at yeah. this point in Internet history. It's like, oh, yeah. I've seen this before, even though yes. I've never seen this before. Exactly. But it fits like, a profile. Like Yes, exactly. Uh, this one, it will stick in your brain, and you can send it as, I propose uh, the new the new Rickroll should be El Internet. I'm going to El Internet you. Internet. Ah! Stop El Interneting me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to feedback. First feedback with Brian and Tom on Oh, yeah. What is haunted about that video that we can't ever get Tom to appear or hear the entirety of it? What no, is going no, no. on with that? I'm waiting for another copy of it, but I, I actually yeah. still owe Jason like twenty dollars Canadian. So yep, until I pay him. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he's like, Tom. He's not going to show up in the feedback sentence and say uh, video until then. <laughs> All right, let's uh, start off with Tommy the Hellhound from the eighth most dangerous city in the United States to live in, Baltimore. Home of the wire. Uh, he says, a question I'd like your input on. How much do you think the channel lineup placement with sat cable satellite providers affects TV show ratings? For example, my Comcast cable has, from channel 28 to 35, AMC with The Walking Dead and The Killing, Bravo, CSI, and Law Order repeats, TNT, Glades, Terriers, etc., TBS, Sci-Fi, Spike, A&E, then three channels up in Discovery Channel, because I only need to go one or two channels up or down to find something cool to watch. I don't look at channels 12, NBC, 15, Fox, 21, CBS, or 23, ABC. I do go to channel 9 every now and then to check on USA shows like Burn Notice, but I have to consciously try to go there. Only other three channels I go to are for news, MSNBC, CNN, and C-SPAN. Even when viewing one of these channels in the first paragraph, I pull up my cable's guide and show channels around current one. Then either an up button or down button shows maybe six to nine options, which I'll find one to latch onto. Think networks pay dollars to provide for optimal placement next to another network with a killer show or two? Uh, first of all, I'm really glad that you actually read all those details about what channels and up and down or whatever, because for the life of me, I totally tuned out. I'm like numbers, numbers, something channel, because I can, I still cannot name one channel that, and I have the biggest package. I, I have all the channels. I've got the HBO premium or whatever. I don't even know what the channels are to get to them. I know that I, that I found them once. I use the guide to, to slowly scroll through 8 million to, and then I say, record that. It's like, I, I, I remember experiencing television that that way, but now it just seems quaint and old to me, and I can't even remember the last time I paid attention to channels. What about you? Yeah, I, I actually know the broadcast channels just because they kind of get ingrained into you in other ways through advertisements and people saying like, oh, yeah, the Giants, they're on, they, they move from Channel 2 to Channel 11. So I know Channel 2 is Fox. I know Channel 11 is NBC. I know Channel 7 is ABC. I know, I know those. Channel 9 seems to be PBS everywhere I've ever lived, which is kind of odd. Uh, but, 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 but then above that, I know 244 is sci-fi. Do you, but do you watch, uh, like, uh, you have to relearn it because you got the regular feed and then the HD feed on cable as well. well no, like, see, on DirecTV, they're the same. Okay. So oh, Channel really? 2 is, is the HD feed. They don't okay. put it up on 802 or, or, or something like that. So that makes, yeah. it, that makes it easier to remember. But on uh, DirecTV, you don't get USA on Channel 9. Everything that's cable, everything that's not broadcast TV is at Channel 200 or above. So I know like 201 is CNN, I think, or 202. But all I, all I know is like if I want to watch ESPN or CNN, I type 200 into the guide. 
pop over there, see what's on, boom, and then I select it. I know 244 is sci-fi because I go there often enough. And I know the BBC America is somewhere in the 200s, and I think Bravo is somewhere in the 300s, and I know Tech TV used to be on Channel 354. Can I can I tip of the hat and, you know, maybe lament Wag of the, the loss of something that I really used to enjoy? Uh, I think anyone who was born... Uh, or anyone 15 years younger than I am, anyone who is less than 20, has never experienced fast channel surfing yeah. the way mm-hmm. you could 15 years ago. Yeah. Like it pre it, pre remote channel surfing. Obviously, no, no, not, obviously not, you had no, no. I'm just saying pre remote channel surfing. Even though you had to be out of your seat, was the fastest channel surfing ever. It was like snap, 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 snap. You're boom, seeing boom, content, boom, boom, content, boom, boom, content. Then we got the it's, remote, and there was a little bit of a delay. But, you but know, not just a little bit, not if, much. If, if, if you, you could still, you know, if your television was still plugged directly into the cable and it was using the analog tuner in the TV, you could go pop, 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 like that. Yeah, but there and, was there was it still wasn't as fast as flipping that that actual dial well, manually. Cool. But it was still really fast. And then all that's, of a sudden we got guides and digital, and all of a sudden it's like and, channel. Wait a minute. Okay, the guide loaded. Okay, there's a the channel. Channel. See, yeah. Now, what if that could be the new killer app where you customized your channel placements and it was constantly pre-buffering channels above and below where you were? AT and T Uverse does that. I would so pay ten extra dollars a month for fast flipping for for being able to go through everything. Have you switched to AT and T Uverse? No, I would not do that. Okay. Uh, and to answer uh, Tommy's question, by the way, the, it's not as easy as you pay more and you get a higher placement, but television networks that make cable companies more money get higher placement. And how they make the cable companies more money can be either because so many people watch ESPN uh, that it's absolutely worth it because you put ESPN on there and everybody subscribes, or you know, less popular channels actually sometimes will pay the cable companies for placement, in which case they'll, they'll, they may raise it up. Uh, but the cable companies generally try to keep like channels together because they want to make it seamless. They want to put all the news channels together. And they sign agreements to say, look, if you're going to be carried on channel 354, you're going to be news. You're going to be in the news category. And you can't change the type of programming you have to something else because that messes stuff up. It was a big deal when Comcast bought Tech TV and merged it into G4, whether G4 was continuing to fulfill the agreement to provide news programming, which is Tech TV was in the news tier. When is they, that when part they, of the reason that they uh, that they made sure to call it Tech TV G4 or G4 Tech TV, yes. whatever it is, that middle ground? That, I, think, I think that was a I think that played into it. Uh, but it, it's a really complex situation. So it's not as easy as I pay more and I get higher. But yes, the more popular channel is and the more money it's going to uh, be seen as making for the cable company, the higher the placement. Yeah, generally. Got another email here from Matt Bat. I really want a sequel movie to The Fifth Element. Okay, maybe it's hard to go bigger than Saving the Planet. All I really want is a movie or show based in that world. I want to know what those animals were that they blasted out of the shuttle. I want to see more beds and showers magically come out of the walls. I want to see Chris Tucker and Drag again. What has he done lately? Also, I watched The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo on Netflix streaming. What an awesome movie. The shooting was beautiful. The story was rich. The characters were real. I loved it and can't wait to see the next two. I heard they were going to make an American version with Mr. Kissy Lips Daniel Craig. I think I'll skip him. Join the SGU Save Facebook page. Or join the Save SGU Facebook page. Oh, love the show, Matt Bat. Uh, I love how all over the map his letter was. And um, I do want to ask you, part of, partly the reason I picked this letter is, did you like The Fifth Element? Uh, you know what? It's grown on me over time. When I first saw it, when it first came out, I didn't like it very much. I thought it was too doofy. But, uh, you know, as it's sunk into the, the general consciousness, I've gone back and I've seen it bits and pieces on TV and I think I've watched it fully from beginning to end one more time on on a rental DVD uh, a while back it's I've warmed up to it and and now I see see more humor in it than I used to well, and I wish the problem, maybe it was a marketing issue, because I remember when I watched it, wanting to see some kind of Blade Runner-esque Yeah, song. yeah, I think and that's it. it. marketed that way, and in fact, it might be fun after the show to actually go back and watch the trailer to see how they marketed it, because I was sorely disappointed by the silliness aspects, especially when Chris Tucker comes out so over the top, and when the fifth element was love. Oh, by the way, spoiler alert, the fifth element is love. Oh, wait, Red, spoiler alert, Red, you've totally ruined the movie. Oh, that's exactly, okay, if that ruined the movie, <laughs> the movie had big problems. <laughs> but yeah, um, uh, 
however, I'm with you. Even after the movie, even after I hated the ending and I was disappointed by how how cheesy parts of it were, Gary Oldman, freaking amazing. Doing doing an evil H. Ross Perot was awesome. Yeah. And uh, the world, I think, is I think it is an interesting world with the colors and the over the top uh, action scenes and the the bizarre way everything's laid out like a cruise ship where everything comes in and out of the walls, that kind of thing. Um, Maybe I'll go back and watch it again, but I'm with you. I would like to see another movie set in that universe. The sixth element. The sixth element is hate. You heard it. Hate. Here. All right. That's it for this episode of Frame Rate. Everybody, thanks so much for joining us. You can email us, show at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Please do send us a line. Let us know what you're thinking and what you're up to. We'll talk to you next week. Uh -huh.